There was a summer play thing you could get in the 60s. It was about two feet wide and 12 feet long. It was either blue or green and stretchy. You put it on the grass and turn the hose on it. It was called a slip and slide. It was what we did when there was no pool. One time, friends in Riverdale had one, and I threw myself on that thing from a standing up position over and over and over. <laughs> Total exuberance. So naturally, when the babysitter was going to take us to Coney Island, I was ecstatic. I thought well, there were going to be a lot of slip and slides. <laughs> Too small to hold the metal hanging thing, I held the pole. We got off the subway. Me, my twin sister, our babysitter Renee, and her friend Jacqueline. White and Haitian, Renee was sexy and slender, but curvy, with painted pink nails and toes and frosted pink lipstick. She wore thick black eyeliner that curved at the end of her lids. At Coney Island, we strolled down to the beach from the boardwalk. It was 50 times more crowded than the subway. People everywhere, sitting, standing, waiting in the water, walking, sunbathing. The sun was very bright, and the water was crispy and frothy. I threw my arms to either side as if I were going to hug the ocean and ran down to jump in the waves. Laughing and full of energy, I turned around to smile at Renee and Jacqueline and my sister, but they were not there. I turned the other way to see them, and they were not there either. I walked to where we just were, and they were not there. Frantic inside, I kept walking and looking and searching, and finally, I went up to the boardwalk and found a policeman. I was small enough to pull on the end of his blue jacket. <clears throat> I'm lost, I said. With no warmth, he said, come with me. <laughs> he took me to the station. I sat there the entire day. And by the end, I was convinced I would never see my mother or sister again. When Renee showed up, she was in a rage. I was six. Even then, I knew it wasn't right that she was mad at me. I was despondent. I had been lost. I didn't deserve that. After Renee, we had Mrs. Carter. She stood like a mountain in the, at the end of the hall. She filled the doorway in a light blue short sleeve button down cotton dress with stockings and black shoes. Her skin looked and smelled like chocolate pudding. And I got lost hugging her. She would hold me as long as I needed, even until I was 18. We were six when she started with us. She was the most loving, kind, and warm person. Her name was Rena, but we always called her Mrs. Carter. Um, as a kid, I knew she had a grandson named James, but I never asked about her own children. She cleaned and cooked. She waited for me, for me upstairs when I had to walk up the five flights because I had gotten stuck in the elevator three days in a row. She helped me get out of the elevator and understood that I could no longer get inside that box. <laughs> Mrs. Carter always did the right thing. She was so large and so gentle, and her hands always smelled of Clorox. <coughs> One day, I came home from school, and she was sitting at the dining room table crying. What's wrong, I asked. President Kennedy has been shot. She was sobbing. I put my arms around her as best I could, and I sat with her while she cried, but I really couldn't comprehend why she was so upset. She was really like a mother, something I was pretty short on because my mother worked all the time. In the film, Do the Right Thing, none of the mothers are right. The character called Mother Sister sits at her windowsill. She comments on the activity on the street below but no one listens. The second mother has a tiny child and is so impatient about her boyfriend that she hardly notices him. And the third mother is a grandmother. She is silent and says nothing, though she shakes her head in disapproval. Mrs. Carter taught me that a mother always does the right thing. 
1964, I was nine. I went to the Walden School in New York City and was picked to read the lines from Dreams by Langston Hughes. It was the memorial service for Andrew Goodman, who had gone to Walden. I was proud to be chosen, and I took it seriously. It mattered to be part of the ceremony. Andrew was a white Jewish kid from New York City who had gone down to Mississippi to register black people to vote. He joined Michael Schwerner, another white New Yorker sent there by CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. They teamed up with civil rights activist James Earl Cheney, who was black and from Meridian, Mississippi. They called it Freedom Summer, but the kids disappeared in June and were found dead in August, murdered by the Klan. They were all barely in their 20s. I stood on the stage with my quivering legs and my big voice, and I said, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken-winged bird that cannot fly. The Walden philosophy was everybody was everybody. Skin color didn't matter. Money didn't matter. It was the kind of school where we called the teachers by their first name. And if they put an achievement test in front of you and you burst into tears, they would sweep over and whisk the paper off the table <laughs> and comfort you. <laughs> Although later, I would find out that this was my idea of the Walden philosophy, because there was only one black kid in the whole school, and that was Robin Foss Foster in the grade above mine. So when our family ran out of money, and I had to go to William J. O'Shea Junior High School, 44, I was not prepared. I still thought everybody was everybody. So the first day of sixth grade, I'm in my seersucker jumper with white knee socks pushed down to look cool and saddle shoes. No one in the seat next to me. The teacher brings over a kid who looks about 14. She's tall and thick and stuffed into a sleeveless shift. She has on dirty white kids, no socks. And Miss Raymond says to me, Martha, this is Sylvia Perez. She is from a thatched hut in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Sylvia sat down and gave me a bewildered look. I knew she couldn't speak English. But I see, saw her hands on the desk, and the tops of two of her fingers were missing. I think, oh, she must have leprosy. I wonder how this is going to go, since I don't speak Spanish. I feel sorry for her, and I don't know what to say. I touch her arm, and she pulls away. Suddenly, at the front of the classroom, a tiny black kid named Michael Hill screams at a tall and pretty Puerto Rican girl, Jennifer Morales. You better take that back, or I'm going to kick your ass! He pointed at her, and she shrieked back at him, and then he bolted. Michael put the fear of death into me. His fierce anger was like nothing I had ever encountered. I was shook up. The next period was science. Mr. Harris introduced himself. I think I'm going to like him. I think he's the kind of person I recognize, warm, friendly. And I think, all right, this is going to be OK. But then, out of nowhere, a fight erupted. Carol Tripp and Patricia Green hitting, slapping, punching, and beating each other up. I sat frozen in my seat as a huge clump of Afro hair landed right in front of me. This was nothing I knew. Mr. Harris stopped the fight quickly. I shook in terror. It was the first time in my life I had ever seen a fight, never mind one between two black girls. I got a hall pass to go to the bathroom and to calm down. When I got there, three girls began to taunt me. They threw lit cigarettes at me, and one of them told me that a guy is coming to rape me. I did not understand their anger. The kids were tough, mean, and ran the whole school. I didn't know if anyone was okay to be friends with. Everybody was fighting everybody. 
I didn't think anyone is going to be like me. I didn't know who was. I realized that if I was going to be here, I would have to make friends with the tough kids or get caught in the crossfire. The cafeteria is the worst time at school. It's a madhouse. Online, I saw Regina, one of the toughest kids in my class. I went up to her, and I don't know what I said, but I watched her face morph from a kind of, who the hell do you think you are, to a soft, open, and friendly, I like you expression. <laughs> I'm going to look out for you, she said. The next thing I know, Patricia Green was there, and the three of us are together on the line. I figure out. I figure even if everybody is not everybody, you can find somebody to hang out with. During the time that I went to IS44, Martin Luther King was killed. On that day, there was a real upheaval at the school. By then, I had made friends and felt fine with everybody. The teachers rounded up all the white kids and sequestered us in the third floor classroom for our protection. We had to stay there for three hours till things calmed down. I was not afraid, but lots of the kids were crying. After junior high, we had money again, and I was able to go back to Walden for high school. All of my same friends were there, but I had changed. I could see I knew what was going on in the world. 44 had changed me because then I knew for real that everybody is everybody. <laughs>